afternoon, so we'll start now. Um, thank you to everyone for, for coming in and uh, joining us at this month's uh, meeting of the Ledge, uh, Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. Uh, it's always a mouthful. <laughs> um, and uh, we have a very interesting topic, I think, today, talking about the next chapter of the Supreme Court. I don't think it could be a more timely uh, event. In fact, uh, you know, when we first sent out the invite to the event, I don't even think we knew who the uh, who the nominee was at the time, although we all perhaps uh, suspected. And so um, this could not be, I think, any more timely. Um, I am going to, uh, so I, my name is Jonathan Bidlack. Uh, I am the uh, interim director of the governance department at the Archery Institute. And uh, today we're going to have two panelists, actually, one of whom is going to join us shortly. Um, to, to just do a quick introduction, um, Anthony Markham is a, a resident fellow at the governance department uh, at R Street. Um, he is an expert on the federal judiciary and separations of powers disputes. Um, he has had his work appear in the Washington Post, USA Today, and actually a very prominent piece that I think we will talk a little bit about in Politico today. Uh, prior to joining R Street, he worked at a boutique litigation law firm in Michigan and has clerked in federal district courts in West Virginia and New Hampshire. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor at George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management and uh, has a, his law degree from Rutgers Law School and a Master of Laws from Georgetown. So uh, thank you, Anthony, for joining us. And um, being with us shortly uh, will be uh, our, also our colleague, James Walner, a resident senior fellow in the, in the governance department, uh, an expert on the Senate. I believe roll call has called him an all around procedural badass, if I may say. And so uh, James will sort of be able to talk a little, little bit about the, uh, the role of Congress in the upcoming confirmation uh, process. Um, James is a, uh, a lecturer at the Department of Government at American University, a fellow at American University's Center of Congressional and Presidential Studies. Uh, and he previously was at the Heritage Foundation where he was uh, vice president for research there. Uh, and it also has a lot of Hill experience, worked in the offices of, uh, well, uh, uh, on the Senate Steering Committee during the chairmanships of uh, Senators Pat Toomey and Mike Lee, and previously was Legislative Director to Toomey and former Senator Jeff Sessions. And so, um, Anthony, this is, I think, a great conversation to be having. As I said, it couldn't, I don't think it'd be more timely. Um, there are a lot of things to say, but I guess what we should maybe just start off by having a quick discussion about where things stand. Obviously, uh, you know, the, the current confirmation battle has been, uh, I guess, to some degree, slow to get off uh, out of the gates just because of the, the recent issues with COVID over the last week. And so uh, maybe you can kind of give us a sense of the, the current lay of the land and, uh, and, you know, where what we can expect in the coming weeks. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. I think it's important to note that obviously COVID has thrown a wrench into this entire process. Um, before um, COVID had kind of swept through the Senate, we have a number of senators now who have either tested positive or are currently self-quarantining um, for health reasons. The timeline, the interim proposed timeline, was still incredibly ambitious. Um, when a vacancy occurred with the tragic passing of Justice Ginsburg, um, and then you had the subsequent announcement of Judge Amy Coney Barrett from the Seventh Circuit, once on that Saturday when it was announced, we had 38 days to election day, um, or 38, 38 days to election day. The process, typically in the past, do you think more recently for Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, has been a little over two months. And so getting this done before election day was already ambitious. Um, you can see that Chairman Graham on the Senate Judiciary Committee has scheduled hearings to begin next week, Monday the 12th. Those hearings will probably go four days, I presume. The first day, you're gonna see opening statements, probably an opening statement by Judge Barrett herself. Uh, the next two days, those Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll probably have Judge Barrett on the hot seat where she's gonna be answering questions from senators on, in multiple panels. That final day might either be open or probably in closed session with a number of witnesses testifying on behalf or uh, testifying about their knowledge or understanding or the implications of a Justice Barrett on the Supreme Court. And then if all goes well, um, there will be a final vote. And so that vote on the committee would happen or be scheduled to happen that week, though um, the minority party has the right to what is called holdover. So probably you're gonna see a committee vote on Thursday the 22nd. That gives the full Senate, and James can elaborate more on some of the procedures and obstacles that the majority in the Senate are gonna have to overcome. But you're probably, if all goes well, a final vote on the 29th or 30th. Now that was the ambitious timeline before COVID. And now with COVID, we have two members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. You have um, both Senator, uh, Senator Lee and then um, 
<laughs> pardon the name to keep me for a moment. So you have center lean, center tilts, excuse me. Um, both have um, diagnosed with COVID-19, both uh, quarantining. You also have um, Senator Sass and Senator Cruz quarantining at the moment, four members on the Republican side. Um, unlike the House, you don't have a lot of proxy ability on the Senate side. And so what's going to happen is to do a vote for this nominee, they're going to have to appear in person. Now, it could very well be after their 14 day, after their 14 day quarantine, but it's going to be awfully close. And, and if, assuming no more, uh, no more COVID-19 problems happen, you also have the issues on the full Senate floor as well. So that's where we currently stand. We have a very ambitious Senate timeline. We have a number of COVID-19 scares happening in the Senate. And then all of that um, beside a lot of Democratic objections to having a vote this close to the election. So a lot of things are happening at once. And unfortunately, it's going to be a very chaotic two weeks. Yes, I think that is, uh, I think that is, <laughs> and I think it will likely be chaotic beyond that, as we know, in the, in the chaotic four weeks. Um, I think we can talk a little bit about, you know, uh, in the future, uh, this conversation when, when James joins us, joins us about uh, what is likely to happen if we don't get that confirmation before election day. Mm -hmm. But um, I do want to jump for a second to your article, which uh, obviously I think is a, a quite the provocative one. Uh, the title for those who haven't seen it, and I'll paste it in the chat window shortly, is for the Supreme Court, eight justices would be better than nine, where you propose what I think is a, a pretty innovative solution. And uh, before we get into the solutions, though, I think we should talk about the problem of the court. I think there are a lot of people who are very concerned about um, the independence of the court and, and specifically the court's role within the context of our current um, balance of power system. And so, you know, in your piece, you write, you say, uh, quote, reformers from both ends of the political spectrum may disagree on what exactly is wrong with the Supreme Court. And so um, before we kind of get into um, the solutions that are on the table, I think it'd be good for you to talk a little about what is wrong with the court. Um, what do people, generally speaking, or you know, court observers think is wrong? And um, do you think that these assessments are accurate? Or uh, is there a part of the picture that's being missed or, or being sort of um, uh, overemphasized, I guess, at the expense of, of other potential problems? I think it's most important to know, and we raised this in our article from Politico this morning, is that you think of Justice Ginsburg again. Justice Ginsburg was confirmed by over 90 votes. The same with Justice Scalia. You know, not only, not only were those two friends, but they're ideologically opposites, yet they both saw nearly unanimous or unanimous support in the Senate. That sort of support is not going to happen today. And you have to ask yourself, why is that support not going to happen today? I think um, I, would, I would argue, and maybe James would see similarly, that it's because of this political reliance on the Supreme Court that has grown exponentially. Of course, politics has always been a part of the court. Marbury B. Madison stemmed with a political dispute and trying to get court trying to get judges onto the court the very last minute between administrations. Those sort of shenanigans have always been there in our history. But that sort of reliance in the absence of other political opportunities I think, is a, I think is a little more novel. And so once you have a similar ambition where people want to get things done, people want policy achievements, people want to change things either in Congress or in their local government, that ambition is always there. But if they see that inaction and a lack of results in those typical political arenas, they're going to go elsewhere. And one of the places they've gone are the courts. And so because they've gone to the courts and these political reliance on the courts to solve their policy dilemmas and their policy disputes has increased the politicization of them. From the, the, if, if the Congress is gonna be tasked with trying to resolve more political disputes, more politics are gonna creep there. And that's one of the problems you're gonna see. Yeah, I think the, uh, the history of the court is really fascinating. I mean, one of the things that I, I learned in your piece is that obviously, you know, I think we knew that the, the court has changed in size, but I didn't quite fully appreciate how there were many occasions in history where there were an even number of justices, as you propose, um, mm -hmm. and, and quite that it wasn't, um, you know, sort of this steady progression. I think that, you know, a lot of times, a lot of political observers generally think that, that politics kind of just progresses on this even line. And actually, the, 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 the number of justices increase and decrease at various points and, and um, was, you know, even in some periods and, and odd in other periods. And we sort of operate in this current assumption now that it has to be odd. But of course, it hasn't always been that way and need not be that way. So I wonder, James, if maybe you could talk a little bit about that history. And, and, and the, other, the other part that struck me was that, you know, we had this sort of back and forth and changing of the size of the court over time. But that basically changed, you know, post-Civil War, they're really, the, 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 the ebbs and flows that we saw prior to the Civil War basically have stopped and the size of the court has been fixed. 
very long period of time. And so maybe talk a little bit about, you know, why that is and how we kind of got to, to where we are currently. Certainly. And I think the way in which we think about the court <clears throat> relates to how we think about the rest of our politics. And I think you see beginning in the post civil war period, um, a situation whereby uh, politics begins to be more institutionalized. And I think we begin to be a little bit more uncomfortable with the idea of uh, separate powers, separate coordinate powers um, that basically have different functions that come into conflict with one another at times, but in the process create a space whereby government can and politics can happen. And it's no coincidence that after the, the court is perceived at least in the, in the public's in mind to be set in stone as if the clouds parted and some stone tablets came down and it said there shall be nine justices and no more or no less, um, that it's also the late 19th century, early 20th century, where the idea that the, the, the judiciary has the final authority in all matters whatsoever relating to the Constitution really gets set in stone. That they are the last resort, or as uh, John Adams, I mean, not, not John Adams, uh, James Madison says in a, in a letter to Jefferson in 1823, and a bit sarcastically, he refers to them as the ultimate arbiter, capital U, capital A, and points out that that's not the way in which our system uh, was set up. And so I think it's, it's really helpful when thinking about the court and thinking about how we think about the court to try to put ourselves in the shoes of the framers, not because they are perfect, by no means were they perfect, um, and not because the early courts were perfect, they weren't perfect either. But I think it does help us get a, a deep appreciation for our system and how we can relate and integrate that court into that system. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great point. Um, I think, I mean, let's, let's shift back, maybe, maybe now that you've joined us, to uh, talking a little bit about about the the Coney Barrett nomination um, and specifically what we know about her, I guess. I mean, you know, one of the I think critiques that we all know that's that's being levied about her nomination specifically is that just ideologically she's very different than than Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so the the concern is that um, of course the ideological balance on the court would shift dramatically. But I know Anthony, you've pointed out that that you know contrary to popular opinion uh, or, or perception. Most Supreme Court cases are not five to four. There's a substantial agreement uh, between the justices on most things that come before the court. And so, um, you know, maybe we can talk about a little bit about how how does Coney Barrett's nomination should she be um, uh, should she be seated uh, threaten or or or. or perhaps how will it change that ideological uh, makeup? And, and are there ways that it might change the court beyond sort of just that, that ideological sense? Or is it something that this is kind of much ado about nothing? Well, I think there are, there are a lot of important parts to tackle there. And we can start at the very beginning with her biography. What do we know? Well, we know that she clerked for Justice Scalia. She even said in her, um, in her speech after President Trump nominated her, she very much sees herself in the same judicial mold as a Justice Scalia. Her literature, her academic um, background, she was a professor at Notre Dame. She wrote a lot, actually, on constitutional law and stare decisis, stare decisis being that doctrine of how to apply law, how to apply the precedent of law, and when do you apply precedent, and when can you change precedent? And she's written a lot about this, and I imagine during her confirmation hearing next week, that's going to be a big part of the discussion. Um, you know, at the Seventh Circuit, she was confirmed in 2017 and has um, written either a uh, majority or dissents, roughly 100 opinions, and a number of those are not controversial. They're strictly applying Supreme Court precedent as a circuit judge would do. Um, a few were interesting. And I think it's worth looking at her questionnaire, um, which was submitted uh, last week, and which noted some of the more notable opinions she believes she's written. Um, one of them concerns um, one of concerns due process implications for felons that have firearm restrictions. Um, another one, which is very interesting, concerned due process for at Purdue University, someone who's accused of assault and the due process implications for someone accused. Um, that's that was the sort of opinions you know that might be raised during the confirmation hearing, but really dive into her her scholarship, her expertise, her writing ability, and how she views the law and. But there are some things, even if she's a conservative jurist, you're just not going to know. For example, you can look at President Trump's first two nominees, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh. Um, they were both conservative jurists. They both reached conservative opinion. Yet they don't see eye to eye on nearly um, on, on a lot of these cases, a lot of important cases. And I think you can see that in the first two terms of these two serving together. They have separated not only on their views of stare decisis, on how to apl apply certain rulings, You've seen them disagree on a number of cases. You've also seen them agree 
on maybe cases you wouldn't expect them to, thinking of maybe the cases concerning President Trump's tax returns. And because Judge Barrett has been a circuit judge, um, there are some things from her actions there you're just not going to know until she's on the Supreme Court. A lot of what you see on the Supreme Court is negotiation. How are, you going to, how are they going to tailor rulings? Is Judge Barrett going to write incredibly broad opinions that are joined by few people? Or is she going to enter more of the Justice Kagan mold of maybe seeking more narrow rulings, trying to um, gather and, and have more people come to her side or maybe join in a more narrow opinion, join in some of the more legal strategy um, that makes some of these Supreme Court justices very successful in getting the results or getting the opinions they want out there. And so some of these things you're just simply not going to know until a Justice Barrett is confirmed. Yeah, and I want to I want to talk a, a little bit later about uh, you know some of the some of the, the solutions and some of the ways in which the court might might change. I um I want to address I think perhaps maybe the political part of the process first. And and James, to you, you know, obviously Senate Democrats are very much working to stop the nomination process to do whatever they can. Um, I think you know my my sense is that there are two broad categories, I guess, of of. Uh, ways of, of gumming up the process. You know, one is the procedural and two is the sort of political and, and um, broader, uh, you know, uh, public dialogue that's happening with respect to the court and, and, and Coney Barrett's nomination in the current uh, context. But uh, I wonder if you might be able to talk a little bit about some of the tools that Democrats have at their disposal, which ones you think they are likely to use or not likely to use and, and how the pre and post election timeline uh, perhaps impacts their willingness to, to use those tools and really the political reality of for Republicans as well if they're not able to get the uh, a, a nomination vote before before November 3rd. Certainly, and I think uh, this question is related exactly to what um, uh, Anthony was just saying as well with regard to the justices. The simple fact is that nothing is a done deal in the Senate until it is done. And the reason why is that senators are all individual people and they represent individual states and that contain individual constituencies and voters. And our concept of polarization as a blue team and a red team begins to break down when you look at the details and you begin to expose people to different sorts of information and kind of pushing and poking and prodding them along the way. And the same reason why they're, you know, if you say, well, a conservative justice and a liberal justice, well, what does that mean? We just saw some cases recently with regard to um, with Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch ruling in a way that, that other uh, conservative justices, uh, supposedly conservative justices would disagree with um, and, and vice versa. So I think that the idea of uh, ideological um, cohesiveness uh, between conservative and liberal blocs is not, is not a good way to understand the court and not a good way to assess the impact of adding any one person to the court. Uh, in addition to that, with regard to the, the Congress, like, if you want to win a debate in the Senate, you have to play the game better than the other side. And if you are not advantaged at that particular point in time, if you're disadvantaged, that means you have to redefine the narrative and use every tool that you have at your disposal to do so, so that when that decision is ultimately made, it will be made in an environment that's more conducive to you winning. And that's where I think we go wrong with understanding the Senate. We typically look at it as a snapshot in time and we say, well, this is where all the votes are. But Senate debates aren't decided at the outset, they're decided at the end. And senators, the leverage they have is not to veto things, but to use different tools they have to help you know, redefine that debate and redefine that narrative. With regard to, to Barrett, I think that Democrats need to not boycott the hearings. They have some tools within the judiciary rules. They can postpone a committee hearing for a week. They can, um, they can refuse to show up at the last minute to, to report her out. But in order for those decisions to have the maximum impact, they need to, to be seen as good faith players in the process. They need to be emphasizing time, not uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which all Republicans are going to just point to the courts on. None of them, my guess, is want to repeal it anyway. I mean, when was the last time you heard a Republican say Obamacare? Um, and then, you know, so they're going to point to the court. Barrett won't, will not speak to it in her confirmation process. So I don't know why this is a good lens or a good narrative for Schumer. But what is a good narrative is, is we don't know. This is an unprecedented rush to um, confirm a justice and with all that's going on right now. We do not know what's going to happen. We do not know what's going to come out. We should not shortchange this process. This is a lifetime appointment, and the American people deserve to understand what this justice thinks and how she understands the law and the Constitution. I may like that, but I, you know, I think that that's if you want to defeat her her nomination before election day, that's what you have to do, so that when the Republicans then go out of their way to change the rules, 
they do so in a way that affirms your narrative because they're going to do it. If they have the votes, they have the votes. But what you want to do is lose in a way that you ultimately win in the end. So that when that vote gets to the floor, it looks like the Republicans have done every single thing they possibly could to force this nominee through the process over the objections of any reasonable person. And then all of a sudden, what does a suburban voter in, in, in Denver say? Right? What does Mitt Romney say to himself? All of a sudden, then you're confronted and you're focused all this intention on this confirmation vote, and you've taken the steps necessary to shape that environment so that it's more favorable to you and less favorable to the Republicans. Yeah, I think there's a, my sense is that there, it's a very, um, uh, while we all always focus on these nomination fights as sort of the immediate, the immediate flashpoint that everyone wants to talk about, there are these, there are these really bigger questions about the role of the court um, and specifically the the role of the court in our sort of separation of, of power system. Um, you know, my my sense is, and I know we've, we've talked about, all three of us have talked about this, that, you know, there's been, I think, a a push toward um, you know having having issues be decided in the court because of the fact that Congress uh, doesn't necessarily want to legislate on these issues, um, and so maybe both of you can talk a little bit about how we've seen the incentives of legislators change over time, as the role of the court has changed. And I think I think there are two ways I'd like to hear your opinion on this. One is you know just as a body, how do you know how do how do legislators uh, incentives change? But also, you know, uh, there's there's this other component I think where the ideological makeup of the court may change the incentives of the particular parties operating in the, in the legislative system. So, you know, if 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 Coney Barrett, it, let's just assume that the the popular narrative is true, and um, you know she ends up being seated, and uh, and the court has a, a a lurch to the right ideologically, it seems to me that that you know my my gut is that. Uh, Republicans would be more inclined to have issues be decided in the courts, and Democrats would be less likely to be. And, and perhaps there would be more of a willingness to to rethink the role of Congress if we actually had a more, um, uh, you know, a, a court that was was sort of shifted ideologically in, in one direction or the under, other. And so, uh, I, I'm curious to hear both of your both of your thoughts on on how we've seen the incentives of legislators change over time and, and how this nomination, or just generally speaking, a, a, an ideological shift can have an impact on, um, you know, on the, the, uh, the incentives of, of maybe one party vis-a-vis -vis the other operating within the confines of, uh, of the first branch. Yeah, and let me jump in, sorry, I, Anthony, real I, quick on this, just because sure. I think there's a great example, very timely, and I'm gonna pivot to Anthony. The Democrats are now talking about taking steps if they win in November to restrict the influence of a conservative court. But that's not actually what they're doing. They're taking steps to increase their ability to control that influence. So when you expand the number of justices on the court, which Congress has the constitutional power to do, they can reduce them, they can expand them. Court packing is kind of a loaded term. Um, but they're, they're doing it so that they can control the courts. And so in the past, Congress would push back against the courts. They would do all sorts of things when they disagreed with the courts. John Marshall would call up Henry Clay on the phone when he was Speaker of the House and say, hey, Henry, buddy, um, can you please stop this bill that would restrict our jurisdiction, which is the constitutional power of Congress, and incidentally um, require increase the number of justices for us to overrule uh, and declare a law of Congress unconstitutional. John Marshall, everybody's favorite chief justice, is calling to defend, he's getting someone in Congress to try to stop something in Congress. And I think that shows you how in the past, Congress would take steps again to protect itself. Whereas today, those things are seen as illegitimate. Those things are seen as beyond the pale. But what is okay is for us to do things that will make it easier for us to control the court when we're in power. And I think that is why, I think that really underscores the difference between now in the past couple of decades, or the last two decades, and say like everything that came before. I mean, when was the last time you heard a conservative say the words judicial activist or judicial supremacy? I mean, literally, I mean, it used to be on everybody. I mean, conservatives were naming their babies, like I'm opposed to judicial activism. And now it's like they never even talk about it anymore. They're like, I don't know who invited that person to Thanksgiving. We don't want them here. Sorry, Anthony. No, I guess I have to cross that off of my potential baby names list anymore. But, you know, it, it, James raises an important and vital point, and I'll kind of, and I'll say something quickly on court packing and then dive into the other parts of Jonathan's question. With court packing or expanding the Supreme Court, a lot of popular ideas, the idea that certain seats were stolen, so you have to replace those seats with additional seats, go from 9 to 11, for instance. I, you know, in, in both blocking Merrick Garland's nomination and 
and the subsequent nominations, there was nothing there was nothing that the Senate did that was in violation of the Constitution. And I think James could speak more eloquently on this as using the rules or using precedent or using strategy to their political advantage. Uh, for expanding the Supreme Court, I mean, it, it would take, it wouldn't take uh, changing the Constitution. It would change, it would require a statute, it would require legislation, and it'd be simple for Congress to do it. Would it be politically wise? I mean, there, you read a lot of op-eds and you read a lot of essays saying that the only way to preserve the legitimacy of this body is to expand it. I have yet to see a good answer on how Republicans don't retaliate in five seconds once they, once they have legislative control. It's something I don't, I think it's politically and institutionally incredibly short-sighted and it's going to backfire. Now, going to Jonathan's other points, um, you can think of um, political, even state legislatures being enthusiastic to take disputes to the courts. One example from just this last term, the Louisiana abortion case, where the Louisiana legislature had created additional restrictions on abortion clinics. And in the lower litigation, a part of that to get it into federal court so quickly because they thought they had their hook and they had their case, was they actually um, didn't raise standing. Standing was an issue in the lower courts, whether the parties actually had stand or this is the appropriate case for it. That was waived because they're so enthusiastic to get to federal court. What ends up hurting them at the Supreme Court is that exact issue. And the, and the legislature um, makes um, standing arguments that were novel for the first time at the highest court. And John Roberts' concurrence, he, he, noted, that, he noted this. And in Breyer's majority opinion, I believe, um, it was also brought this up. So you can see instances of just this eagerness, this political eagerness to move their disputes to the federal judiciary sometimes ends up biting them. It's not only do they assert arguments that are waived, they could lose. And that's, a, and that's another issue. If you go to court, there are winners and losers. And often you can be a political loser and a legal loser. I think if you see the Supreme Court ideologically one-sided, let's say you have a 6 3 seven, two Supreme Court of maybe more conservatives than liberal justices, I think you're gonna see alternative strategies not only in state legislatures, but also in state courts. We have 50 state constitutions. There are a lot of different laws and constitution, constitutions out there. I think often this has been noted on the conservative side, but I think it's gonna be noted more on the more liberal legal side as well to use these state constitutions to your advantage. They are far broader and have many more words than the federal constitutions do. And so using those and using different um, state courts and, um, to, gain more, uh, to gain more political wins. I think that's gonna be a strategy you see if, it's, if there are fewer, uh, if the, the Supreme Court is seen as not as uh, evenly divided, so to say. So let's, so you mentioned being evenly divided and I should say before I go into this that, you know, to anyone who has questions, um, please do feel free to add them into the Q&A section. I will be happy to uh, hopefully get through all of those and address all of them before, uh, before we finish up. Um, love to hear, hear from everyone. Um, so let's talk about this question about, um, you know, not just having an evenly divided court, but explicitly perhaps even making it a goal to have an even number of members on the court. Uh, so, you know, you both have uh, produced a, um, a written an op-ed that I think presents a very novel potential solution. And so uh, I guess we should start by, you know, lay out the case for me. I mean, why should we consider, I mean, you know, we know obviously, as, as we mentioned earlier, that historically there have been periods where the court had an even number of justices. Um, but what are the, let, let's lay out the case. Why do you think that the, the Supreme Court in particular would operate better if we had eight justices or, or an even number of justices? And I guess a, a corollary to that, that question is, you know, is, it, is, is eight the right number or is, is the principle really that we need an even number of justices? What's sort of the, uh, you know, what's your, what's your perspective on those questions? I'm gonna let Anthony take the lead on that and then provide any color commentary that I can. Yeah, well, so we'll start with the very beginning. And I think at the beginning of our conversation was talking about the, the political reliability on the federal courts to solve our policy and political dilemmas. The one thing about an even member court is that a lot of those decisions that are maybe seen as um, partisan, 5-4, really, really, really controversial, the Bush v. Gores of the world, those end up not being resolved by the Supreme Court. And that might seem politically frustrating at first, but here's the rationale. The rationale is an evenly divided court. What does that do in effect? Well, it creates no law. It, it, is, um, it affirms the circuit court right below it. So as we have a line in the Politico piece, the law is the same today as it was the day before. And that sort of, that sort of incentive 
um, helps in a number of ways. One, I think it's important to note that this doesn't drastically change the work of the court. Very few of the court's cases are actually 5-4. Today, they see 70, 80 cases a term. Less than a, fewer, fewer than a quarter of those cases are 5-4. And not often, and not every time are they necessarily 5-4 conservative liberal. You see many, many different configurations. Um, and there are great resources where you can see this. And I just pulled it up on a screen and just out of curiosity to remind myself, what were the percentage of 5-4 opinions over the last few years? Last term, 21%. The year before that, 28%, 26 2016, 10%. You see, you see um, those 5-4 opinions necessarily don't dictate the control of the courts, even though they're the most commonly cited and recorded. And even if you can recall opinions that did have a lot of political implications, think of, again, the Trump tax returns case. Those were 7-2 cases. Why were they 7-2 cases? Because they were decided on narrow grounds. They were decided on narrow grounds, maybe procedural grounds. And that's the type of collaboration you're going to see on an eight-member court. To get, a, to get a legal victory, it's going to require potentially some compromise and working with someone maybe you ideologically disagree with, but where can you find common ground? And reaching that legal common ground, what happens? Well, your opinions typically are more reliable, they're more consistent, they're more narrow, and so the political implications of them are less. And so where do those political implications go? Well, they go somewhere else. That momentum and ambition is always there for policy changes. So instead of going to the federal courts, they're going to go somewhere else, and ideally in the forums where they're supposed to occur. James, you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And it's one, the court is in a small p sort of way a political body in there. And I think that on these more controversial decisions, if you have a divided, evenly divided type structure where there are the possibility for even divides, I think that you're going to get more small D deliberation, which is, I think, a, a good thing potentially and kind of give and take. I mean, this is what made, you know, I keep mentioning John Marshall, which incidentally was nominated by a lame duck president and uh, confirmed by a lame duck Congress and had more unanimous, uh, I believe more, Anthony can correct me if I'm wrong, but more unanimous uh, decisions during his time as chief justice than any other chief justice. Part of that is because he switch to the, um, you know, the single opinion versus the ad seriatim opinion. And so you could kind of cover up a lot of that. But a, a lot of that was John Marshall was really good at politics. And we forget that. And I think he had a sensitivity for the institution. And what it does is it can force issues back into the back into the, the political sphere. And if you read, and I'm looking for my Lincoln first inaugural here, but off the top of my mind, when Lincoln in his first inaugural address, which admittedly is not the more famous of the two inaugural addresses, but should be read by everyone today with regard to the court fight, when he talks about the Supreme Court decision, Lincoln discusses the way in which I think not only he, but also the founders perceived Supreme Court precedents relating and pertaining to two cases, uh, relating to particular controversies. And in today's age, when you have more of a judicial supremacy type view, uh, it's, it, it, the temptation is too great. When you begin to see that the court is a place to make law, then you're going to want to make law in that place. And Anthony made this point very well, I think, before. When you, and the reason why people on both sides, the left and the right, prefer, uh, prefer litigation strategies to the hard work of, of actual politics uh, <clears throat> outside of the court, they do it because once you win, you win ostensibly. I mean, the court can reverse itself, but it's a, it takes a lot longer. If you, if you lose in Congress, then fine. You can get up the next day and try again if you want. When you lose in the court, you're like some unconstitutional scum who should just show themselves out the back door. I mean, that's the kind of sentiment like you've already, like you, not only are, did you just get outnumbered today and, and you didn't play as well as you should have, you were literally like anti the constitution. And I think that's a very tempting and alluring um, prospect for people who want to legislate their goals um, in this country. And, but there's a different rule, there's a different word for that. It's called rulers. And, it, and I think this goes back to us. I don't think this is where the court wants to be. And I think that we ultimately um, create this situation by what we, I mean, the citizens of America are elected representatives in Congress by refusing to engage in the hard work of politics and deliberation and compromise and negotiation. And instead we look to rule our opponents. And a 5-4 split, a 6-3 split, anything is, those are all great because that means that we have a better chance at ruling. When the court's evenly divided, 
and they have an even number of justices, well, that kind of goes out the window at that point. And then even the prospect of, of, a, of a divided court will send shivers down uh, even the, the faintest spot, you know, judicial supremacist spine these days. How's that for color yeah, commentary? Are, <laughs> I think those are great. I think those are great points. Um, we got a question from William that is along these lines that I think you, maybe we've, we've addressed to some degree, but I'll, I'll ask it explicitly. Um, he asked, do you think if Congress performed more of their role, actually passed legislation, then the Supreme Court would recede in controversy because Congress would actually be legislating? So maybe you can address that directly. Yeah, I, I mean, no, I mean, the Supreme Court's going to be controversial. The Supreme Court has always been controversial when it makes issues, opinions, and rulings that, that are controversial. I mean, I think that's something we need to keep in mind. And that's okay. And we need a vital court. We need a court that is willing to tackle controversial issues, in my opinion. Anthony can speak to this much more than I can. <clears throat> but what is more important is not necessarily Congress legislating, although that's certainly the case that they're not legislating right now. That's a big part of it. I think there's but the real problem with regard to Congress right now, William, is that Congress, there's a, sh there's a shift in how Congress thinks about itself vis-a-vis -vis the court. And it can legislate all day long and still hold this view of itself as an inferior body vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution when compared to the court or juxtaposed to the court. That's the issue. And until Congress decides that it is okay for it to use, it doesn't mean that it ought to. It doesn't mean that it's morally good. It doesn't mean that it makes sense. It doesn't mean any of those things. But constitutionally, it is okay. It is not the end of the Republic if the court passes a law to strip or the Congress passes a law to strip the jurisdiction of the court outside of its original jurisdiction, or if Congress passes a law to change its size, or if Congress passes a law saying it requires eight justices to grant cert to a case, or if Congress, I mean, that's Congress using its power under the Constitution. And those are the things that Madison had in mind when he said that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And right now there's this perverse environment where the court's not exactly ambitious. I don't think they're trying to, to rule us all. Um, and, and it's, I think, Congress's lack of ambition that ultimately creates a vacuum and allows for this situation that we have today. So it's not necessarily legislating. It's, it's, it's basically looking in the mirror and saying, I am just as good as the court. Every day, members of Congress should say that in the mirror. I also get to decide what the Constitution means. And then we can argue about it. And then the people ultimately will decide. Anthony, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think I don't think necessarily the Supreme Court is going to recede from all controversy. But like James mentioned, I think um, there are still going to be important parts of the Supreme Court still part of our political lives. But I think most importantly, it is interesting to know that I, I, I agree and, I'm, and I believe in the sense the Supreme Court as an institution isn't necessarily ambitious. They have a lot of this power and a lot of this influence really thrust upon them. To, to resolve a lot of these decisions. And so I, I'm, I'm curious to see if um, kind of the more of the John Roberts you know, ideas of standing and political question, and a lot of these judiciability arguments really um, continue to rise and become um, even more important as more of these controversial cases get sprung up to the court. And I'm curious if the Supreme Court is going to continue to evolve these certain doctrines of what certain disputes should even be heard. You can think of a couple of years back, the gerrymandering case, which had both an excellent majority opinion by Justice Roberts and an excellent dissenting opinion by Justice Kagan, really two incredibly persuasive good views of how this should be managed. But in the end, gerrymandering, one of those huge, huge issues ended up to the Supreme Court, not resolved by the Supreme Court. But what have you seen since? I think you've seen more of a democratic, um, not a democratic party, a democratic strategy to change gerrymandering in respect of states and jurisdictions. And I think that's going to be one of the instances you might see in the future, or example you're going to see in the future, where if we can't get it done in the courts, we have to get it done elsewhere. And how are we going to do that? So let, let me play devil's advocate to the idea of, of an even number of justices. So I think you, you've made a, a persuasive case that uh, at least on the margin, we would see you know, fewer, perhaps controversial cases um, coming up to the Supreme Court. Um, but don't you run the risk of, of polarizing things even more? Um, because now you've basically um, you know, punted some of these decisions, first of all, to district courts or appellate courts, 
where that, that may be even more, uh, you know, left or right of center. Um, and you also, all you've really done in a sense is change the incentives of people who bring lawsuits for various reasons um, to just focus even more of their effort on, on you know, those, um, you know, the appellate courts, for example, rather than the Supreme Court. So you haven't really gotten rid of the perceived problem that, that currently, you know, may or may not exist, um, so much as just, you um, you know, decentralize it in a sense to a number of courts um, where the decisions that come out of those courts, um, they may be just as measured as the decisions coming out of the Supreme Court, but uh, they may be even more sort of, um, you know, uh, ideologically oriented or however you want to frame it, um, you know, part, maybe perhaps partisan, um, than, than you would get with the Supreme Court. And of course, there, there's a secondary question to this, which is that, you know, the Supreme Court, as, as we know, does have this sort of mythical status in our current uh, political, um, political system. And so there is, I think, a lot of people have deference to the decisions from the Supreme Court that may not exist uh, in quite the same way, at least at the current moment at the appellate level or the, or the district level. And so, um, so you run the risk. I could see a situation where um, you just create a whole lot more controversy. Um, and because there is less deference in that context, um, you know, you, you've only gone and, and made the current problems worse. And I'm, I'm saying this, not necessarily saying that I, I buy into this argument, but I do think it, you know, a lot of people will find that, that line of reasoning persuasive. And so I wonder how you, know, what, how you both uh, would respond to that, that line of critique. Well, I think the first it's thing about, is that, go ahead, Anthony. It's a valid criticism and it's an important one to note. The last thing we need, and one of the often reasons the Supreme Court grants cert is if there's a circuit split if there's a disagreement among the circuit courts on an issue that's incredibly important. It, you want the, yaw, the law to be as uniform and consistent as possible. It's difficult to think of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers all of the West Coast, maybe has one radically different view of something than the Eleventh Circuit, which is in the Southeast. That could be a huge and significant problem. I think what's going to happen if you had an even number court is you're going to see some of the behavior and the strategy of how justices take and accept cases and rule on them will change. Um, under this scenario that we propose, you would still need four justices to grant cert as it is today. So that could very well happen. Once a case is in the Supreme Court, there's going to be more incentive on the justices part to rule in a sense to, to resolve these controversies and resolve these disputes. So I, so I think some of this is reliance on the justices themselves changing on how they approach these cases and not necessarily accepting cases and ruling on cases with this long-term institutional lens of, well, Rule, rule A here, and then B, and then C, and then we've set a foundation to maybe get a legal result that I would love to see in 15 years. I think instead you're going to see we need to resolve a lot of these disputes quickly. There, um, we, need to re we need to rule in a way that's uniform and consistent and manageable for Americans across the country. Yeah, and I think the present, it's important to keep in mind the present course that we are on is not good for the Supreme Court. If, you know, just let's use a hypothetical here, say, um, Barrett is confirmed prior to election day or even during a lame duck Congress and a whole slice of the country thinks that the court now is illegitimate because of that power grab and stealing justices. And these are not my words or terms um, from, from the Obama administration. And so that, that's not good. And so what do they do in response? Well, they say, well, let's, let's, let's pack the court, right? This is the nomenclature we're using, the idiom we're using. We're going to pack the court. <clears throat> and so at that point, then you have another slice of the country over here who says, well, I don't think that the, this court's legitimate. And the court is dragged down into the, the fray of normal everyday politics, which is not good for the court. And the second that happens, the court loses its legitimacy. And that's problematic for the court because the court cannot legitimize its own decisions. It cannot enforce its own decisions. The court is the weakest branch, which has always been odd to me why either anybody in the debate, any ideologue or anybody who feels passionate would go to the courts because it seems to me that's the first one of our institutions to go when things start crumbling, if they do. So the present course is not good for the Supreme Court. I think John Roberts understands that and appreciates that. I think it explains a lot of the decisions, some controversial, some not, that he's taken. <clears throat> John Marshall certainly understood that as well when he tried to reorient the court away from a more kind of activist type path that it was on uh, prior to his uh, taking the Supreme, uh, the Chief Justiceship. Um, but the challenge then becomes, how do, how do we solve this problem? How do, how do we correct it? And that means that we have to, doing so, has, we have to correct how we think about politics. Right now, the way we see the Supreme Court is incompatible with the separation of powers, and it is incompatible with our political system. It does not fit. 
And we need to acknowledge that. And then we need to figure out how to incorporate it in order to save the court. And I think one way, and this is, I don't know if Anthony necessarily fully agrees, but it's a great, it's a great way to highlight the problem. Maybe it's a kind of like break thing so people will notice them. But you know, jurisdiction splits are the biggest reason why senators will say we can't have an even numbered court. I mean, this will be the end of the world. And it's like, well, if the Supreme Court is making law, making nationwide law instead of resolving disputes and controversies, and you go on vacation from Chicago to like Disney World, and the law means one thing when you're in Chicago and it means something else when you're in Disney World, well, then that's going to wake you up and you're going to be like, what? This doesn't make any sense. Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Well, it's like, well, with, with the Supreme Court didn't you know, rule, sure, but you had this court ruling one way and this court ruling another way, when in reality, sh should we be seeking to resolve all of our nationwide policy issues in the courts? And I think that's, a, and it can force Congress back into the conversation. It can, it can waken people to the problem that we have today and say, Congress, get your act together. Give the courts more direction so that you have fewer splits or strip things from the court so that we have fewer splits, um, you know, all other sorts of things. But the idea of finality in the Supreme Court prevents this from happening, I think. This idea that we're going to go there and we're going to win. And once we win, it's over. And that's just not the way American politics is structured. And I think an even number court is a great way to awaken the people of that, precisely for the same reasons that others may think it's a problem. Got a question on on uh, sort of on this topic, I guess a, a, a similar version to to what you all are describing. And the, and the questioner asks, "What do you think of the idea of making it so that SCOTUS decisions have no force absent a supermajority of justices, six or more, uh, agreeing in a case? Does anything in the Constitution forbid Congress from enacting law to do that?" And so that strikes me as as an idea that is effectively very similar, because obviously, if you if you restrict the the Supreme Court to to eight justices, you you're you're requiring there to be a supermajority, or I guess close to a supermajority. And so, uh, but I'm curious as to as to your take on on that twist on on your idea. Well, I think you might see some both pragmatic and constitutional problems. I think the pragmatic one, I think you're going to see a lot of frustration with presumably a majority opinion that has no effect. And I can see, you know, this some of the same arguments that some might have over the um, electoral college. Oh, well, um, this nominee got uh, more votes, but they didn't become president. That doesn't seem fair. Whether that's correct or not, there's some grumblings I think are going to exist, and probably even worse so because this would be a new. This is this would be brand new. This would be a new presentment. And so I don't know if it necessarily solves any of the problems we're currently debating. Whether the Constitution forbids or not, well, it's a very interesting separation of powers questions, and one that would probably be unresolved. Who would ultimately look at that? Well, probably the justices themselves. Um, one of the interesting things I could see about it is, I think often when it comes to what ways Congress can have oversight and dictate what the court does. I think often, I think there's a difference between the internal administrative um, ways Congress can handle itself versus some of the external. The external being the number of seats, its jurisdiction, the issues they're allowed to handle, um, how, whether, they're whether justices are confirmed or not. I think those are some of the external things that Congress and particularly the Senate can deal with. Some of the internal things, I think there are separation of powers limitations. An example would be a code of conduct. Often we could think of the administrative office, U.S. courts, which is responsible for the lower federal courts. They can't, they can't um, for, for separation of powers reasons, this is the argument they'll present as well, Article 3 forbids them from mandating a code of conduct on Supreme Court justices because they don't have jurisdiction over them. The AO looks at lower district courts. Um, Congress can't force that onto the Supreme Court. They can, offer, they can pressure them to through a variety of other legislative ways. Um, and there's been legislation introduced um, over multiple years to do something similar. But I think, you're gonna, I think there's enough of a divide there that I'm not sure if that would be uh, possible to implement on them anyway. Yes, and I think this gets back to, and this pull, you know, brings me back to my Lincoln first inaugural where he's talking about Supreme Court. Um, one, I, I tend to think that Congress is the only branch of the federal government that in the Constitution has explicit and plenary power over its rules of procedures. It can set rules of procedures, it seems to me, for the other branches, if it so chooses, as long as it's not violating explicit constitutional uh, provisions elsewhere in the document, which the Supreme Court, incidentally, and U.S. v. Balin in the 1890s agreed with. I mean, like, that's like, you know, maybe I'm contradicting myself a bit here and pointing to the Supreme Court as a source of authority. It's like, we can't question it at all now, but so it has the authority to do all sorts of things, but it's the, 
even this though is the there's a lot of controversy over you know it's in the founding the courts the framers recognized the supremacy clause clearly allows the courts to declare things that are in the states unconstitutional with regard to congress judicial review is a little bit more dicey um and it's something that is not well i think theorized in our politics today or even back then but how we think about a case matters what gives the supreme court power is our fidelity to the rule of law when the supreme court rules in a case they're ruling on a dispute between two parties and as lincoln says in the first inaugural that ruling even if erroneous it's like okay but it's the damage is limited because it's not you know a supreme politburo that's making law for the entire nation and so what then allows for that precedent to acquire law-like status is that other courts, other district and appellate courts, other members of Congress, other state governments, and everybody else can say, well, you know, they begin to factor that into their decision-making process. And they know that if they do something that's the exact same or very similar, and they run all the way through the process, they're gonna fail. So that's the equivalent of like, well, that's a law. So I'm just gonna change how I behave. And so it's that kind of mentality is, that fidelity to the law is the thing that I think our current kind of uh, focus on uh, the Supreme Court and judicial supremacy is ultimately going to undermine. And that's the, I think, the ironic thing. And so, you know, it's, you know, I think we need to focus more on how do we force the public to acknowledge what's going on? How do we help to create this environment where the public and, and their members of Congress can have these debates? Um, because if you have these kind of silver bullet solutions, and, I, and I'm a fan of them, I think they're interesting and intriguing, what ultimately happens is that we still move forward in this idea of, oh, well, we're, the court's where we ultimately make this decision. And so we're going to pass this rule so that this decision will not be made until maybe we're in charge or ever. But we still think that's where they make the decision. And it's that mentality itself that ultimately is, I think, damaging to the republic. So let's talk about another silver, silver bullet solution then. Um, we, got, we got a question that I think is a very, a very interesting one. Uh, the questioner writes, in addition to changing the number of SCOTUS justices, should there be a change to the process of how they are selected? One idea is to create a rotational process where judges from the federal court system are selected to be SCOTUS justices for a set term limit. And we haven't touched on the idea of, uh, of term limits too much in this conversation. And so uh, maybe we can talk about uh, that issue, that issue more broadly in the context of the Supreme Court. Well, I, I can I can start there, and I've been critical of term limits for a couple of reasons. One, I think there's a legitimate constitutional argument. You know, at the very elementary, of, of course, Article Three talks about um, life tenure, and it's it's you know they serve for what quote good for good behavior. That's that's commonly and universally understood to mean life tenure. The typical way around that, and that's, is, I think, suggested in the question, and this is actually legislation that was also introduced recently by um, Rokana and among others, is what, what you would do is create a panel system where maybe after, after 18 years, for instance, if they served a term, they would go back to the circuit court. Or if there maybe there's a regular process where you just have a bunch of circuit court um, judges, and then every now and then they go on to the Supreme Court. My, pro my problem with that is I think you see a specific constitutional divide between the office of the Supreme Court and all the inferior courts. I think the Constitution is very clear that those are completely separate offices, and so you can't intermingle them without being, not, without being nominated and confirmed for separate offices. So you'll see um, very frequently maybe district judges who maybe go and serve at a circuit court. They'll be on a panel. Um, or maybe every now and then a circuit court judge will go down to a district court, or even after retirement, as Justice Souter did. He went from the Supreme Court, now sits on a circuit court. I think that's perfectly okay if they voluntarily choose to do that. My problem is the inferior courts can really be structured and set and go any way you like. I think the, that separation, that specific constitutional separation, prevents that sort of rotation that was suggested in the question. Also, for my mind, also blocks the uh, end around um, on the most common term limit plans as well. And I, I'll let James go ahead, but I also think there's also logistical reasons why it's not going to be as routine and regular and as helpful as a lot of people think it might be. Yeah, I, I typically agree. I, I, I don't, um, I'm not a fan of term limits. I think they're unconstitutional if done outside of the constitutional amendment process. I think the good behavior language is pretty, pretty explicit. I do think that the question of, and just to Anthony's last point, I, you know, John Marshall makes this argument and he loses, I uh, just for, 
for the interest of friendly uh, debate here, he, to his fellow justices uh, shortly after Congress repeals the Judiciary Act of 1801 and sends the Supreme Court justices back out on circuit. And Marshall says, we can't do that because we were never confirmed to be circuit court judges. And the, his colleagues uh, say no, and they have a vote, a majority vote, which is a very political way of making decisions, incidentally. Um, and they then decide that they're going to go along with it, even though against Marshall's kind of, you know, his, his misgivings. And so I think there's precedent that clearly, um, you know, that the court has at least um, in the past um, believe that it can serve as both a circuit court and a Supreme Court justice at once. But, you know, it, there's lots of other ideas out there, but I think ultimately it, it requires uh, a constitutional amendment. Sortition is another great way. Imagine that you have a hat or a big box or a big raffle machine, and you put names of every appellate or circuit court judge in the nation on, the, uh, on, on there, and then you put it in, and there's a vacancy coming up, and you can couple that with like a term limit, right? And so you said five years, you're on. When you're off, you just kind of roll this thing and then all of a sudden a name comes out and that person goes and sits on the court for five years. That alters the dynamics incredibly immensely because at that point, Congress, they have no clue who's going to be sitting on the court. The people have no clue who's going to be sitting on the court. They're going to be more attentive to those lower court justice judges in the confirmation process, which they should be and not treat them as like, well, whatever, we're just going to, you know, who cares? It's going to be 98 to nothing. They're going to say, well, this person may end up on the court. For a period of time so let's really pay attention here and it limits the ability or the allure of control but again i think that's something that ultimately has to be done uh via a constitutional amendment and but lastly and if, unless you're getting to this root problem i mean term limits doesn't really solve the problem either it just says well we're going to term limit these people who are trying to rule this because they don't agree with this and hopefully we'll be in power then and we can then nominate people who will for a period of time and so I think that's the key underlying kind of issue or challenge that we face right now. We are, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to, I want to ask one last uh, closing question and it's about the future of the court and where you see the court going. And I guess I'll, I'll ask it in, in two parts. The first is uh, maybe, you know, whether you're willing to put your chips on the table in the current nomination fight and uh and, you know, how do you handicap it? What do you think is going to happen? How do you think it's going to play out? What do you think the odds are of, you know, a lame duck appointment, for example, compared to prior to November 3rd or, or um, Coney Barrett not being uh, ultimately seated at all? And I think then the, the, the second part to the question is, you know, where do you see that we, we talked a lot about the, the problems with the court, different solutions. Um, what do you think is likely to happen, um, you know, post November 3rd? And, and really in the years in the future, I mean, you know, James, you made the point that the, the current trajectory really isn't sustainable for the Supreme Court. Do you think, uh, are you optimistic that we will ultimately end up having some reforms that will maybe put it on a more, uh, on, on a better path? Or do you think that, that we're potentially headed down a road where the court, um, you know, runs into some, some uh, more pointed political trouble? Well, I, I certainly hope we're not heading down that road. I mean, we need a court. Uh, the court is a vital institution of our federal government. It is absolutely critical that we have a strong and healthy federal judiciary. However, that judiciary is structured. It is completely good and right to question how we ought to uh, pick and select our judges in a, in a democracy. That makes complete sense. Um, but ultimately, I'm not, I don't fear the, the court more than I fear for the court, if that makes sense. Because ultimately, in America, in a self-governing system, the people rule. And the people eventually will grow tired of the, and this is what happened. This is what has happened in the past in American history. And so I think what will, in, in so the, you know, the court just loses its legitimacy along the way. That's the tragedy though. It loses its ability to do the, the things that it was designed to do. And that ultimately is, is a real problem for our system because we need all three branches to be healthy and strong and counteracting each other and coming back and forth against each other because parchment barriers do not work in practice. And I just want to close in saying that, you know, this, so I've mentioned it several times, and I finally found the quote in the first inaugural in Lincoln, when he gives the first inaugural, he's talking about Dred Scott, but he says, at the same time, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by, de by decisions of the Supreme Court, the instant they are made, in ordinary litigation between parties, in personal actions, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having, to that extent, practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. It's not John C. Calhoun. It's not Spencer Roan. 
This is not some states right as Orville Favis or somebody else from the 1950s. This is Abraham Lincoln saying, if you let the courts make all of the decisions, then you are no longer free. And I don't think that the American people, for better or worse, are going to, to, to tolerate that indefinitely. And that's the problem and that's the tragedy. And I, and I, and I hope that in this current confirmation battle over Barrett and other justices that may come, that, we can that more and more people will be awakened to the underlying political dynamics at stake here and what we need to do to ultimately safeguard the court from losing its own institutional legitimacy. Anthony, you want to close us out and have any, have any comments? Sure, and I don't have a lot to add, but I will say this. There is actual worst case scenario for the Supreme Court. We talk about legitim legitimacy often in this abstract view. What is legitimacy? Well, it's the legitimacy that their opinions should be respected and then enforced. If those opinions are not respected and enforced, that's your worst case scenario, which again, that would incentivize a rogue president, a rogue governor, a rogue legislature. We need this system to work. And if the system is off balance or one is ineffective, all of it's ineffective. And so that's why it's important to think about what's best for the court. Fortunately, if many of our policymakers are not considering that, I think the court is themselves. I think in the short term or maybe even the long term, I think you're going to see an evolution in legal doctrines that have the court resolving actually fewer cases for a number of judiciability reasons. And I think that's a path you kind of see with the Supreme Court with the Chief Justice Roberts. And often I've heard people say, well, the, the Chief Ju the Roberts Court is going to turn into the 6-3 Thomas Court. I think, the, I think the Chief is still going to have an, um, a lot of influence. And I think a lot of that influence is going to be, again, this evolution of doctrine where they're going to resolve fewer controversies through a variety of tools. Um, I think there are some short-term things that can help. I think more transparency, understanding what the court actually does is gonna be helpful. I think it's great that C-SPAN live streams arguments now. I think the more people understand what the Supreme Court is and what the Supreme Court does and how it fits is gonna be ultimately helpful for our politics. A great optimistic note to end on. Um, well, I wanna say thank you to, to Anthony and to James. I think this was a great discussion and really appreciated hearing both of your, uh, both your perspectives on this. Um, I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for participating and tuning in. Uh, certainly uh, uh, hope you all will, uh, will join us next month for the next meeting of the, the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. But uh, thanks so much and have a great rest of your week.